you know, I did a broadcast early in the week that talked about why uh, African Americans eat black eyed peas on New Year's Day. Okay, and it goes back to uh, it goes back to us being in the South, but also black eyed peas come from West Africa as well. They're also called cow peas. So check out that broadcast. We dealt with it a little bit on last week's show. But New Year's Day, January 1st, 1863, was when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Lincoln. All right? So History.com has this article as well as EJI.org, uh, Equal Justice Initiative, which is Brian Stevenson's um, uh, organization. And we know the movie is out, Just Mercy, uh, which is about Brian Stevenson and, and a case that he... Um, a case that he handled that stars uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan and uh, Jamie Foxx, all right? But History.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, has a really good article dealing with this. And this is dealing with um, Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. On January 1st, 1863, Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation attempting to stitch together a nation mired uh, in a bloody civil war. Lincoln made a last ditch but carefully calculated decision regarding the institution of slavery in America. Okay? Now contrary to what they teach our children in school today, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the enslaved Africans. Okay, I encourage people to go to archives.gov. Archives.gov is the official website of the National Archives. Search for Emancipation Proclamation or go to LOC.gov. LOC.gov is the Library of Congress. Okay? And when you read the Emancipation Proclamation, it has all these exceptions. Okay? It, it, it talks about how the, how the slaves in the border states are not free. It only applied to the slaves in the, state, in the states of rebellion, the Confederate territories. Okay? It enslaved Africans in, in places like uh, Missouri and Delaware, uh, Kentucky, uh, Maryland, they, th those were border states. They were still slaves. It only applied to the states in rebellion. It was a military strategy to bring the South back into the Union. The reason why the Civil War was fought. Okay, when, when the Civil War starts, so it, it, it starts with um, South, South Carolina secedes from the Union December 20th, 1860. Okay, and um, when Lincoln is, a, this is six weeks after Abraham Lincoln uh, becomes president-elect. He becomes president-elect, I think it was November 6, 1860. He's the pres he becomes president-elect of the newly formed Republican Party. Republican Party was formed in 1854 by groups, of uh, by groups of abolitionists. The Republican Party was formed as a, was as a backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 uh, dealt with letting the inhabitants, letting those who were going into the Western territories determine whether or not they wanted to have slavery in the Western territories as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government. 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe comes out with her, with her novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, that becomes an international bestseller. It exposes uh, people across America to the horrors of slavery, and the character of Uncle Tom is based upon the fictitious, fictitious character of Uncle Tom is based upon the real life person of Josiah Henson, who was a runaway slave from Maryland, who becomes an abolitionist. He, he, he and his family run away, they go uh, up north and then go into Canada, and he becomes an abolitionist on the Underground Railroad, he becomes a Methodist minister, uh, he becomes an educator, and he writes his autobiography. The character, the fictitious character of Uncle Tom was based upon the real life of Josiah Henson, or based upon the, based upon Josiah Henson, based upon his autobiography, okay? There's an episode of the Jeffersons where Louise's cousin, who is a butler, and George says that he speaks proper and sedity. He comes to visit, and George calls him, an, or actually Lionel calls him an Uncle Tom, George calls him an Uncle Tom also. And he schools them on who the real Uncle Tom was. He talks about Josiah Henson. All right? That's just a little background information. Because a lot of these TV shows, they drop some history in there also. You may not pick up on it. Now, there's an episode of, uh, there's an early episode of Good Times. It was actually, I think it was episode two, Black Jesus. And 
uh, is before 76. And Michael talks about uh, Black History Week because it became a month in 1976. But he talks about, uh, I think it was Muhammad Speaks, where they talked about the true color of Jesus. And J.J. paints black Jesus, and they put up on the wall. And um, uh, his mother, Florida Evans, played by Esther Rowe, fantastic actress. She is surprised to find out that in the Bible, it talks about uh, Jesus having feet that were bronze and, and hair like wool. Now, she's been a Christian all her life, and she ain't know this. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, calling me to ask the question, you know, uh, what have you been studying, right? But all that's in that first episode. Like in the first few minutes of that episode, they're dropping this history. But anyway, so attempting to stitch together a nation mired in a bloody civil war, Abraham Lincoln made a last ditch but carefully calculated decision regarding the institution of slavery in America. Now keep in mind, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. I know people want to paint Lincoln as an abolitionist. He was not an abolitionist. Because Lincoln was confused really what to do about slavery. He, would, he, he thought slavery was morally wrong, but he didn't know what to do about it. Abolitionists knew what to do about it. Abolitionists were fighting to end slavery. They were fighting to help enslaved Africans run away. They were fighting to end slavery. There's, a, uh, there's another article from uh, History.com that people should read. And it deals with, I think it's five facts about Abraham Lincoln and slavery, something like that. And they talk, one of them deals with how Lincoln was not a, an abolitionist. Now, by the end of 1862, things were not looking good for the Union. The Confederate Army had overcome Union troops in significant battles, and Britain and France were set to officially recognize the Confederacy as a separate nation. In an August 1862 uh, letter to New York Tribune, editor Horace Greeley Lincoln confessed, quote, my paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is, it is not either, and it is not either to save or to destroy slavery, end quote. Okay, this is 1862, it's August of 1862. The Civil War starts April 12th, 1861. So this is a year, about a year, four months into the Civil War. Lincoln is saying, my paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union. And it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. Malcolm X talked about how uh, Abraham Lincoln used freeing the slaves as a political football. Okay? This is what he was talking about. Lincoln used freeing the slaves as a political football. Lincoln was, Lincoln's main objective was to save the Union. And at his March 4th, 1861 inaugural address, Lincoln, talk, Lincoln said that he had no intentions to end slavery in states where slavery still existed. Because by February of 1861, you had about seven states that had already seceded from the Union. Starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860. Lincoln is trying to stop, the, he, he's trying to stop the secession. Okay, so he talked about how he had no intention of uh, ending slavery in the, in, in the states that where uh, slavery uh, continued to exist. And this infuriated a lot of abolitionists like Frederick Douglass. Okay, so Lincoln hoped that declaring a national policy of emancipation would stimulate a rush of the South slaves into the ranks of the Union Army, thus depleting the, the Confederacy's labor force on which the southern states depended to wage war against the north. He's trying to, he's trying to rob them of their asset, of the enslaved Africans. Okay, Lincoln hoped that declaring a national policy of emancipation would stimulate a rush of the south's slaves into the ranks of the Union Army, thus depleting the Confederacy's labor force on which the southern states depended to wage war against the north. All right. Lincoln wanted to unveil the proclamation until he, he, he waited to unveil the proclamation until he could do so on the heels of a Union military success. On September 22, 1862, after the battle at Antietam, he issued a preliminary emancipation proclamation declaring all slaves free in the rebellious states as of January 1, 1863. Lincoln and his advisors limited the proclamation's language 
to slavery in states outside of federal control as of 1862, failing to address the contentious issue of slavery within the nation's border states. We're going to pick this up on the other side of the break, 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Future Radio, the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Right before the break, I was talking about January 1st, this past January 1st being the anniversary of the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation. History.com has a really good article, Abraham Lincoln Signs the Emancipation Proclamation. Unfortunately, many people still think it was the Emancipation Proclamation that freed and enslaved Africans, and it was not. It was a military strategy. It was a strategy to bring the South back into the Union. Okay, so we're dealing with this history. I encourage people to go to history.com, history, uh, not the, uh, go to archives.com, the National Archives, archives.com. You can read the Emancipation Proclamation there for yourself. You know, take my word for it. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe me. You go research this for yourself, okay? Go to archives.com, just search for Emancipation Proclamation. All right, so uh, Lincoln waited to unveil the Emancipation Proclamation until he could do so on the heels of a Union's uh, military success. So the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation was issued September 22, 1862, after the uh, Civil War battle at Antietam. Lincoln issued the preliminary Emancipation Procl Proclamation declaring all slaves free in the rebellious states as of January 1st, 1863, unless those territories in rebellion came back into the Union. Okay? Now, they ain't have really... They ain't have, they, so, when these states seceded from the Union, these territories seceded from the Union, they set up their own government. They set up their own monetary system. All right? So, you don't have any authority over them. Because they, they set up their own country. Okay? So Lincoln is, and his advisors limited the proclamation's language to slavery in states outside of federal control as of 1862, failing to address the contentious issue of slavery within the nation's border states. In his attempt to appease all parties, Lincoln left many loopholes open that civil rights advocates would be forced to tackle in the future. Republican abolitionists in the North rejoiced that Lincoln had finally thrown his full weight behind the cause for which they had elected him. Those slaves in the South failed to rebel en masse with the, with the signing of the proclamation. They slowly began to liberate themselves as Union armies marched into Confederate territory. Toward the end of the war, in, which ends in 1865, Enslaved Africans left their former masters in droves. They fought and grew crops for the Union Army, performed other military jobs, and worked in the North's uh, mills, in, in the factories. Though the proclamation was not greeted with, um, though, though the proclamation was not greeted with joy by all Northerners, particularly Northern white workers and troops fearful of job competition, from an influx of freed slaves, it had the distinct benefit of convincing Britain and France to steer clear of official diplomatic relations with the Confederacy. So, when, when, you, when you look at the Civil War, the question we should ask ourselves, because see, after the Civil War ends, so you know you had the Freedmen's Bureau, right? The, the, Bureau, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Land. And the Freedmen's Bureau is not just going to assist black freedmen, former slaves. It's also going to uh, assist poor, destitute white people. Because the, the Civil War destroys um, a lot of the South, destroys plantations, knocks out bridges, knocks out prisons, destroys the Southern way of life large, largely. Okay? The question we should ask ourselves is, we, we have to look at this, right? The majority of the people who fought on behalf of the South in the Civil War were not the wealthy plantation owners. They were not the wealthy slave owners. The majority of them were poor, poor, poor white people who didn't own slaves. Poor white men who didn't own slaves. The majority. Now you're going to have you're going to have some exceptions. You're going to have some wealthy white men who own slaves and plantations, things like this, who fought in the Civil War. But that's not the majority of them. Majority of them were poor white men who didn't own slaves. They're fighting to maintain something they don't have. 
Think about this. They're fighting. So when you read the statements of secession, the statements of secession were the statements declaring the, the statements that the, the southern states wrote declaring that they were breaking away from the Union. Okay? When the original when the original Brexits, right? They were breaking away from the Union. They talked about how slavery was central to their way of life, central to their wealth. The, the, the statements of secession from Mississippi, from Texas, etc. But most of the white people weren't wealthy. Most of the white men fighting in the Civil War on behalf of the South were not wealthy. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how did the wealthy white people who benefited from the poor white people fighting in the Civil War how did they convince the poor white people to go risk their lives and fight in the Civil War and fight for something they didn't have? What they told them was, if the slaves are free, they're going to take your jobs. What they didn't realize was the slaves were already doing their jobs and they were doing it for free. Because there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. The enslaved Africans were already doing the jobs and they were doing it for free. This is what they didn't realize. They fell for the okie doke. Okay? The, the descendants of those same wealthy people are the same people who are, who are saying that uh, undocumented immigrants are taking uh, jobs from people here in America while the corporations continue to profit off of the labor of undocumented immigrants and continue to exploit their labor. Well, at the same time, you got corporations like General Electric that, that are creating automation that's eliminating, that has eliminated millions of middle class jobs. So, when, so see, if you, okay, you got to understand history. If you look at what Trump is doing today and the rhetoric Trump was talking about in 2016, all this deals with the fear of the browning of America, 2043. When the U.S. Census Bureau predicts that white people will no longer be the majority population in this country. Some white people, not all of them, but some white people fear what's going to happen. And they fear the, what's called the browning of America. Right? So, you had Trump in 2016 talking about undocumented immigrants taking your jobs and things like this. He, now, he, he wasn't there. And today, he ain't talking about the corporations that exploit the labor of undocumented immigrants. He's not talking about cracking down on those corporations because he's one of them. At the same time, he's not talking about corporations that put out automation that, e that have eliminated millions of middle class jobs and will continue to do so. Middle class and low wage jobs. There was a study that came out. I did a broadcast. This was, I think, November, October, November. It's on YouTube and Facebook. Go back and watch it. BlackEnterprise.com had an article dealing with how over the next 10 years it's estimated that up to 4.5 million jobs held by African Americans will be eliminated by automation. Trump ain't talking about something like that. Right? The same, the, the same way they con poor white people to go risk their lives to fight in the Civil War while the, while the, while the wealthy were the ones who reaped reap the same majority of the benefits. It's the same thing going on right now with undocumented immigrants. It's the same thing going on. They're telling you they're taking away something that you have, while at the same way, the wealthy are taking that away from the poor whites and poor people in general. It's the same game being played. They're taking trying to take away the health care and doing it. You got less people. If you, if you uh, uh, read the... Um, report that just came out by the uh, every September Census Bureau puts out a report dealing with income and poverty income and, income and poverty and wages they talk about how less people have health care under Trump than under President Obama because of the Affordable Health Care Act Trump is attacking that if you look at we just posted the information from the Brookings Institute okay I talked about this uh, two weeks ago where 44% of uh, the jobs Americans have are low wage paying jobs. Median uh, annual income is $18,000 with about 45% of these jobs. So Trump talks about all these jobs booming the economy, but at least uh, almost half these jobs are low wage paying jobs. Okay? But he talks about the stock market, 
But the stock market is not a good indicator of the overall economy. Then if you look at the article from um, news1.com that just came out, and I'm not going to have time to talk about it tonight. We'll probably talk about this next week. Um, this is one I was looking at. It's talking about the new jobs numbers that just came out. And it's talking about how the unemployment rate for African American men increased. With the, with the, so the first Friday of each month, the new unemployment numbers come out. Now there are six different unemployment rates, U1 through U3. U, sorry, U1 through U6. The U3 number is the one that you hear in all the headlines. Okay? U3 deals with people who have actively looked for a job in the past four weeks. Go to bls.gov, Bureau of Labor Statistics, bls.gov, and search for how is the unemployment rate calculated, okay? So, because they, they, they'll break this down and they'll deal with the six different unemployment rates. The same game that was played in, during the Civil War, and then even after the Civil War, because you had immigrants coming to this country and their labor was being exploited in the factories because this is largely before you have factory regulations, this is before you have labor movements, this is before you got an eight-day work week. I mean, sorry, uh, 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 this is before you have an a, a eight-hour work day and you have uh, children working in the factories, things like this, right? So the, the, the same wealthy people who profited off of poor white people going and fighting the Civil War and risk their lives to maintain a lifestyle that they didn't even, to, to maintain a lifestyle they didn't even enjoy largely, these are the same ones who will exploit the labor of immigrants coming to this country and having them work in factories. Poorly ventilated factories, low wages, uh, very little rights. Uh, the, you, you don't have the uh, rights of the unions. You don't have the, uh, the fair wages, the two-week uh, the, the two vacations, all this stuff. That stuff don't exist back then, right after the, after the Civil War ends. That doesn't exist. And then African Americans largely are being locked out of these jobs also okay and and what's going to happen is you're going to have the you're going to have labor unions that are being formed to protect jobs for white men lock african americans out of these jobs and now that we can compete for these jobs and we have been doing a lot of this work for for years because there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country from 1619 to 1865. The book of uh, The Other Slaves, uh, The Other Slaves by uh, Lewis, Ronald Lewis, and I forgot the other author's name. Okay, just Google The Other Slaves, artisans, craftsmen, they break this down. At the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, when you go through their main display and still we rise, and... Um, you go through the replica of the slave ship and you come out on the other side and they deal with, they take you throughout history, throughout slavery. They have a big display on the wall showing all these skills, trades, and crafts. And I went through that display a few years ago, right? And there's a sign there that says you can't take pictures. So I went home, got a pen and pad, came back, and I spent an hour writing them down and I numbered them. That's how I know they're 262 because they weren't numbered. So the same game that we see being played then, we see being played now. Because it worked. And people still haven't figured this out. All right, so when we look at this here, Republican and uh, Republican abolitionists in the North rejoiced that Lincoln had finally thrown his full weight behind the cause for which they had elected him. Those slaves in the South failed to rebel en masse with the signing of the proclamation they slowly began to liberate themselves as Union armies marched into Confederate territory. Toward the end of the war, slaves left their former masters in droves. They fought and grew crops for the Union army, performed other, other military jobs, and worked in the northern mills. This is creating competition for jobs, working in the northern mills. Though the proclamation was not greeted with joy by all northerners, particularly northern white workers and troops, fearful of job competition from an influx of freed slaves. It had the distinct benefit of convincing Britain and France to steer clear of official diplomatic relations with the 
Confederacy. So what's going to happen after the Civil War ends, this is where you have a lot of large labor unions, the National Labor Union, okay, uh, which is uh, founded about 1866, and the American Federation of Labor, things like this. And they're organized to protect jobs for white men and lock African Americans out of these jobs. All right? Many of these jobs we have been doing for free for years. Now that we can compete for wages, now we're trying to be locked out of these jobs and then locked into, locked back into agriculture, whether it's sharecropping, okay, something like that, domestic work. So this is what takes place. So I'm not against unions, I'm just against unions discriminating against African Americans. Though the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, signified Lincoln's growing resolve to preserve the Union at all costs, he still rejoiced in the ethical correctness of his decision. Lincoln admitted on that day, on that New Year's Day in 1863, that he never, quote, felt more certain that I was doing right than I do in signing this paper, end quote. Although he waffled on the subject of slavery in the early years of his presidency, he would thereafter be remembered as, quote, the great emancipator, end quote. But the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the enslaved Africans. To Confederate sympathizers, however, Lincoln's signing of the Emancipation Proclamation reinforced their image of him as a hated despot and ultimately inspired his assassination by John Wilkes Booth on April 14, 1865. Uh, read, read this article at history.com. Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation January 1, 1863. Okay, check out that article. They have a number of good articles uh, there. And um, one of my favorite ones, and this is coming up here, it's running slowly. Five things you may not know about Lincoln, slavery, and emancipation. Five things you may not know about Lincoln, slavery, and emancipation. I think number one is, yeah, number one is Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist. The 16th president was firm in believing slavery was morally wrong, but his views on racial equality were sometimes.